All right, looks like we have a few people here and waiting in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Sandu. I'm excited to be here today uh, uh, part of, as part of Faith Driven Financial Planning. We're going to be discussing the five tax planning opportunities that most Christian professionals overlook, how to fix them and achieve your God-given giving goals. And uh, one of my favorite scriptures that I love sharing at the, at the beginning of every presentation is this 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. I'm just going to read it because I think it's, it's so important. Uh, it says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in, uh, put their hope in God, which richly provides us, who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they can take hold of the life that is truly life. I just think, I think that's just so beautiful, because as we, as Christians, as followers of Christ, um, one of the things that we are passionate about is taking up that life that is truly life. And so I'm excited for you to be here today. There's a picture of me and my wife and my daughter. Uh, she's just a little over one. And so we have our hands full with her, uh, but we'll go ahead and get into it. So uh, just before we get into the meat of the material, I uh, just want to make sure you understand everything that we talk about is not specific tax, financial, or legal advice. Uh, everything we're going to talk about is hypothetical and educational in nature. So um, a as, a, um, as a resource, I want to make sure that you have access to um, some of the tools and planning tools that I'm going to be discussing today. But the first one is the roadmap. And I just think every Christian needs uh, to have a roadmap in their spiritual life, which obviously for everyone is the Bible, uh, if you're a follower of Christ. Um, but I also think from a financial perspective, the Bible is so rich and full of wisdom. I uh, love reading Proverbs and, and other scriptures that highlight um, different aspects of building wealth, accumulating wealth, saving wealth, uh, but also giving wealth and uh, being tax efficient. And there's just so much rich wisdom in, in the word of God for how to love God and, and serve others. Um, and, and so anyway, I, but I, I think what we've done here is, is really paint a picture for everyone to understand kind of where they are on their financial journey and then how to get to the next spot in their financial journey. Um, the next one is an online, you know, retirement course. This would be for people that are in those late stages, uh, you know, five years, 10 years out from, from making their job work optional. Uh, just really comprehensive information about Medicare, Social Security planning, uh, long-term care, all those uh, sensitive issues as you get uh, close, to, um, close to those years. Uh, next one here is comprehensive planning software. This is really robust financial planning software. This is the same software I use in my practice when we're, when we're dealing with complex tax and estate issues. Super helpful, super powerful. Um, and so we make that available to you as well. And to, re to access any of these resources, you can just go to wisewealthwellness.com slash resources. Uh, and then finally, checklists and flowcharts. Uh, as, as I'll share a little in a little bit, I was a former engineer. So I love checklists and flowcharts. I love making decisions easy and, and going step by step. And so as a resource to everyone on the call and, and anyone who's watching this uh, later on, you can go to wisewealthwellness.com slash resources, and you can view all of the resources uh, mentioned here. All right. So um, are you in the right place? Well, uh, uh, let's, let's get into it. So this is the right training and workshop for you if you believe that God owns it all, right? This, this workshop is really meant for people that are followers of Christ, but not only have, uh, you know, adopt a biblical worldview, but also take a stewardship mindset. Uh, so if you're a Christian and you want to honor the Lord with all of your wealth, this is a great workshop for you. Also, if you have money left over at the end of the month and you want to make better tax decisions with it, this might be right for you if you're already consistently giving and you want to learn how to be a better steward of God's resources. We're going to talk a lot about, uh, about those. So who am I? Well, I'm a former rocket scientist at Raytheon. I've worked at SpaceX and Lockheed and, and another, um, another, uh, um, a number of space startups and, um, and uh, have just had a huge passion for uh, aerospace and defense and um, just going to the stars. And so uh, there was a big passion for me. Still love watching launches. Uh, but I'm also the creator of the Faith Driven Financial Planning System, and I'll, sh I'll share with you how I went from rocket science to financial planning here in a second. But uh, the Faith Driven Financial Planning System has allowed us to do a lot of things, and this is really just pulling wisdom out of God's word, but it allowed us to pay off over $100,000 of, of college student loan debt uh, to save up an emergency fund of one year. Uh, it helped us to become millionaires by the time we turned 33, and actually it was really fun. We got to be on uh, 
uh, share my story on the Dave Ramsey uh, show on, on his video and audio podcast, which is a, which is a huge testimony uh, to the baby steps, but also to implementing biblical wisdom uh, into our finances. Uh, we've, been give, we've been able to give over $150,000 uh, in charitable nation, donations to churches and other nonprofits that we care about and, and we feel God has put on our hearts. Uh, and finally, we've been able to pay cash for the last three houses that we've owned by implementing uh, a faith-driven financial planning approach. Uh, and lastly, you know, I've, I've been able to teach and advise hundreds of families to accomplish uh, these types of similar goals uh, very fast. And so I think there's just a testament to God's glory and God's wisdom by allowing him to have uh, ownership and, and uh, rule in our, in our financial life. So my story, uh, just real quick, I wanna, I, I'm going to give you some context about why, why I'm here talking to you about uh, tax planning and, and opportunities. But my story begins with my dad. And so in 2014, uh, a lot of things happened. It was a pivotal year for me in my life. But one of the things that happened was my father passed away. He, he passed away suddenly. Uh, he had a heart attack in his sleep. And a lot of, uh, I'm one of five. And one of the stories that, that's, that sticks out to me is before my father passed away, we were just talking one day and I asked him, this is actually a picture of us. I, we, I took my, my parents on a cruise a couple years before he passed. And I, on the cruise, I asked him, I said, hey, dad, do you have any investments? Like, what's your, what's your financial planning or retirement planning, you know, accounts? What do they look like? And he said, oh, yeah, David, I've got one of, I've got five investments that I've been pouring money into uh, over the years. And so the, the punchline here is we were his five investments that he was pouring money into over the years. And for a lot of people, that's kind of where they are. They, they just invest into their kids and they're not necessarily thinking about their own financial uh, lives. And so, but I'm obviously, if you're on the call today, you're probably thinking ahead and thinking uh, for the future, but that's really where my story started. And, uh, you know, after my dad passed away, I had to walk my mom through a lot of these tough financial planning questions about, you know, uh, living, cash flow, social security, Medicare, all these types of, of questions as she got into that age. And it kind of just gave me this passion for helping other people. Again, I was working 60, 70 hours a week at SpaceX at the time. And uh, I was just, I just had this conflict. I wanted to help people with their finances because I, I saw the joy and peace that it brought my mom, but I also, you know, was uh, had a career as a, as a rocket scientist. And so I just started teaching financial, financial peace university. I started helping other people, uh, teaching people, just giving people the same practical tools and knowledge. Uh, that I was able to share with my mom and that I gleaned from, from the Bible. Another pivotal thing that happened for me in 2014 uh, or that affected me was uh, that Hobby Lobby went to the Supreme Court. And if you're not familiar with the story, essentially Obamacare uh, and the Affordable Care Act asked all employers to provide abortion care to their employees. Well, Hobby Lobby didn't want to do that because they're owned by a Christian family. And so they said, you know what, we're not actually going to provide abortion care to our to our employees. And they actually, you know, were sued by the government and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a huge win, um, they they, you know, they won a huge win for religious freedom. They won the case. And so they were actually able to not have to provide abortion care to their employees. But one of the things that came out of that story was that actually Hobby Lobby owned a lot of abortion manufacturing companies in their 401k. And so uh, it was kind of this huge you know, paradox of, well, you want to claim a religious exem exemption for your employees, but you also own a lot of these uh, stocks and mutual funds in your employer-sponsored retirement plan. And uh, I kind of didn't really understand what that meant, but I, I started thinking like, does God care if I own, in, uh, you know, these abortion companies in my, in my investment portfolio? And after praying about it for a lot, I realized like God does really care. And so I had to review my own investment portfolios and my 401ks. And I found out that, yeah, I did. And it, it turns out my, like 99% of people own, you know, these types of companies. And so it kind of just opened up this this concept of uh, putting my money where my morals are and investing to the glory of God. And that's this term called biblically responsible investing. And so led me on this journey to study what does being a faithful investor look like? And so part of that, uh, part of that was me just spending thousands of hours studying God's word, understanding biblical stewardship. I started interviewing, you know, millionaires that were Christians and understand like, what does it mean to put your money and your faith in alignment with one another? I started raising, reading dozens of personal uh, biblical personal finance books. A couple of them are, are up on the screen. Uh, finally, I got to study and interview this picture of me and Ron Blue. I got to just really talk to him and just understand, like, what does being an entrepreneur that's focused on aligning your, or just a Christian, aligning with you, your 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 faith and your finance. And so that really led me to find the team of financial advisors that I'm at now. And so that's that's the firm I'm at now. It's called Wise Wealth, really just helping people understand and implement biblical principles into their financial plans. 
Uh, and actually, I was I was actually featured in a Yahoo Finance article. This was this was awesome because I was just I, I was just sharing the message of biblically responsible investing. This is my first year in the business. This is about five years ago, and I just started sharing about biblically responsible investing. And a reporter uh, reached out to me and said, "Hey, can we?" Can we interview you for uh, a, a Yahoo Finance article? And so anyway, it was just a huge blessing, but I got to share my story and also the story of biblically responsible investing. And so that's what brought me from a rocket science to financial planning and how I implement biblical pr uh, practices and stewardship principles uh, with my clients. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today, how to implement our our uh, biblical principles and tax planning. And, and, and a lot of things that, I've, that I have found that I'm going to share with you today are really opportunities. And so that's why I've, I've called this the five tax planning opportunities that most Christian professionals overlook, how to find them to achieve your giving goals. And at the end, I have a huge, uh, a huge uh, um, uh, blessing from uh, David Clinton. He's a giving coach. He's going to come up at the end and share uh, more about, you know, kind of the obstacles that are hindering people from giving. Uh, and so that I'm excited about the, the topic. But the first opportunity that I see that people are, that Christians are overlooking is utilizing a faith-driven financial plan. A lot of times they are assuming what they're operating in is, uh, you know, driven by their faith, but they're kind of disassociated. And I'll talk about that here uh, now. So the first one, the types of giving plans, right? The first one, you might be giving cash gifts. You might be just saying like, yeah, hey, I'm giving, you know, uh, a part of my check. I might be giving 10% or 15% or 20%, whatever that is. You might just be writing it from your bank account uh, to the, to the, um, to the to the donor uh, to the you know the church or the nonprofit. A uh, second one might be investments. You might be giving, or you might be thinking about how how can I give from my investment accounts, or maybe you're selling part of your stock or part of your uh, your brokerage account and, and some of those funds, and then giving them to um, to churches or nonprofits. Um, and then it might be you you might be thinking, oh well, actually I'm going to leave part of my life insurance uh, to my uh, to my church or to to the nonprofits that I care about. But, but I want to share with you some of these missed opportunities is because these aren't plans, these are products. And so what I'm talking about when I'm saying implementing a faith-driven giving and financial plan, I'm really talking about uh, implementing a holistic view of your giving. And so it's important to, to, to view your giving, not just in the sense of, you know, God owns the 10% and I can do whatever I want with the rest of the 90%. The, the outlook that I that I take is that God owns 100% of my wealth and my income, and that I'm supposed to operate in a manner that is in a stewardship role so that I can ask God. I said, God, you know, what do you want me to live on? You own everything. What do you want me to live on? And so some of the questions that your faith-driven financial plan should answer are what are the family values that are most important to us right now? What stewardship goals are we focusing on? This is a lot. Of, this is very different from just a traditional financial plan. This is a faith-driven financial and giving plan. How are we integrating our faith into our finances? Again, I talked about God owns 100% of our wealth, not just 10%. What type of lifestyle do we want to give now? A lot of times when we think about giving, we're thinking about giving uh, money away that is taken away from ourselves. But, but I really think this is an, a, a question of lifestyle. What is the lifestyle that God wants us to live right now? Are we content with God's provision? I think that's another big question. Do we believe that God's wisdom is available and irrelevant to our finances? This is a question of beliefs in our heart. Do our financial values align with our family values? So do our financial values and where we say our family values are, are we saying that you know, Christ is important, that, that giving is important, but do our, our family values align with those and our financial values? How can we be more generous with our wealth? Where do we put the money that we're saving? A lot of times people are not sure, like they, maybe they're saving up to give or they're, uh, have, they want to have a giving fund, but they're not sure where to put it. Uh, what do we want to spend money on, right? Do, how, how do we uh, uh, allocate giving as a percentage of our wealth? Are there more tax efficient ways to give, save, or invest? What legacy are we building and what legacy will we leave behind? Again, when we talk about giving, I always talk about legacy in terms of two things, values and valuables. When we give valuables without values, a lot of times that generational wealth is gone by the third generation. So it's very important that we talk when we talk about legacy and estate planning, I'm more talking about the values and the valuables, not just the valuables or the money. So I think it's important when we talk about uh, giving in a faith-driven financial plan that you understand 
giving and generosity is, is one aspect of your full financial plan, but there's ways to be tax efficient in all of these aspects. And so I'm just gonna briefly, briefly mention the different aspects uh, of a faith-driven financial plan. So the first one is generosity. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 says, each man should give what he has decided. And, I, and the, another word I like here is purpose. What he has purposed in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. So that's the generosity plan. And this is obviously a huge aspect of what we're talking about today. Income planning, anyone who does not provide for their household has denied their faith, right? We wanna be faithful stewards of God's wealth. And so part of that is providing for our own family. Investing, ill-gotten gain has no lasting value. I like to talk, to, I like to talk about faith-driven investing here when I talk about investment planning. Uh, insurance, uh, a prudent man per, foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. I always tell my clients, you know, 100% of people are going to pass away someday. And so it's important to have a plan. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. From a tax planning perspective, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And, and I, always, I always like to, to tell people, you know, it's, it's important to pay your taxes, but you don't have to leave Caesar a tip. And so I think it's important when we're, when we're talking about tax planning that we pay taxes with gratitude, but we don't, we have, there are opportunities and ways to save. Um, and then finally, a legacy. So a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I think a lot of times people just think about inheritance in terms of uh, the money, but a good, uh, uh, an inheritance, I believe, is also the values that you pass down to your family as well. So that's opportunity one, implementing a faith-driven financial plan. Again, that's a holistic plan uh, around your finances, because when you prioritize giving as the first aspect of your financial plan, then all the other things will come into alignment. And that's what we found to be true when we implemented a faith-driven financial plan. It allowed us to prioritize giving. And because we put God at the forefront and the God at the first aspect of our financial plan, everything else was able to come into alignment because we were operating from a stewardship perspective, not an ownership perspective. So opportunity number two here is moving money from taxable to tax and tax deferred, excuse me, uh, to tax to future tax free accounts. So moving money from taxable and tax deferred accounts to future tax free accounts. And when I talk about tax free accounts, I'm talking about a couple of different things, but there are a lot of considerations, especially around taxes that you need to be considering, especially with the sunset provision rule. So we're going to be talking about the sunset provision, uh, tax and estate tax rates, uh, the stretch IRA, uh, these are all, all different things that have changed within tax laws in the last few years. Uh, the RMD age, Roth conversions, and donor advised funds. So these are all tax considerations that I'll be stepping into. So the first one is income tax rates. If you're not aware, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was implemented under the, uh, the uh, uh, excuse me, the Trump administration um, reduced everyone's uh, tax rates by just a little bit. And so you'll see on this column here, on the, on, the, on the right, that in the year 2026, everybody's tax rate is going back up. And it's just maybe three or four or 5%, but it, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, an amount that you won't have access to. And so the things that we're talking about today, you have, to be, you have to be sensitive and considerate of what's gonna happen in the future. And so it's important that when we talk about tax planning, we're not talking about just tax planning for a single year, we're really talking about tax planning for a lifetime. So the first thing is to consider is your income tax rate and understand that those rates are going back up. The second one is estate tax rates. So beginning, beginning January 1st, 2026, the exclusion amount will be decreased from 12.06 million per person to about $6.4 million per person. So again, this also is sunsetting in, in as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And so again, this number, the estate tax uh, uh, exclusion is gonna be moving down from $12 million to $6.4 million. Again, a huge issue if you are, uh, you know, if you have even just a couple of million dollars now, that can quickly get up to the 6.5 million or $6.4 million here. Uh, over you know 10 or 20 years. Okay, uh, a future tax-free account. So we talked about some of the tax laws that are that have changed, but what are the future tax-free accounts that I'm talking about? Well, Roth 401k is one, Roth IRA is another one, and HSA is is the third one. And I want to just touch on these briefly because I think a lot of people are missing opportunities. When we talk about tax planning, we're really talking about how can we re reduce our, our taxes over our lifetime. I'm not talking about just for a single year. A lot of times, you know, people will, will, will advise um, uh, their employees to just defer their taxes. But I mean, especially in the, in the tax rate environment that we're in now, what I'm seeing is it's, it's actually more prudent to pay the taxes now and get those monies into the tax-free accounts for the future. So that's why I call them 
future tax-free accounts. So the Roth 401k, this is a little uh, less known by most people, but uh, a few years back, the Roth 401k became very popular uh, to provide as part of the employer-sponsored plans. And so the Roth 401k, it still has aspects of the 401k in it, but it's contributed after tax. So you, ha you see you have the best of both worlds, in my opinion, the Roth 401k, because it has the contribution limits of the 401k, which is upwards of, of close to $20,000 but it also has the tax-free growth and the tax-free withdrawals once you hit 59 and a half. So this is a really awesome account that a lot of people are not taking advantage of. The second one is the Roth IRA. Now, unfortunately, the Roth IRA has lower uh, contribution limits. It's closer to like six or 7,000, depending on you know, your age, if you have catch-up contributions available. Um, but then also the Roth, um, you know, those, those monies do come out after you pay taxes. The other uh, negative aspect of the Roth IRA, though, unfortunately, is there is link income limitations. And so if you make over a certain amount of money, you become ineligible to contribute to the Roth IRA, which is not the case if you have a Roth 401k. So Roth 401k is not subject to income limitations, and it has higher contribution um, con uh, amounts. So you can contribute more to the Roth 401k than you can with the IRA. And um, it doesn't matter how much income you make with the Roth 401k. So two huge tax-free accounts that I would be taking advantage of if you have access to them. And then finally, the third one is the HSA. So again, when we're talking about being more tax efficient, how can we be more tax efficient now and in the future? HSA is, is a, an, an account that has triple tax advantages. So the HSA, the money goes into the HSA tax deductible. The money can grow and be invested in over you know, 10 or 20 years. And then the money can be pulled out um, uh, you know, in the future for medical expenses. Now, one of the issues that I see a lot of people making uh, is that they take the HSA, they put the money in right now, and then, uh, you know, maybe the next day uh, they, or, the, you know, in a few months, they pull the money out. Well, one of the aspects of the HSA that you might be missing out on is allowing that money to actually grow over, you know, five or 10 or 15, 20 years. And so that's really the power of the HSA, allowing that money to grow over a long term. So that's, that's opportunity uh, number two, I would say allowing those uh, funds to become future tax-free accounts. That frees up money uh, in the future, and, and it also uh, frees up your uh, worry from tax rates, because obviously tax rates, we don't know where they're going, but a lot of people would consider that they would be going up in the future. And so those are, those are three different types of accounts that can free up some opportunities for you. Uh, opportunity number three here is donor advised funds. And so a lot of people tell me that they want to give more, that they want to be more generous, but they just don't know kind of what are the opportunities to do that. And so uh, this third opportunity is a, is a great way to establish giving as a mode of operations in your family and to establish a way of giving uh, in, in, in perpetuity, basically after you, after you pass away, it could be a, a way to establish a giving fund for your family. So I'm gonna explain what a donor advised fund is and how it works. So a donor advised fund, um, the way it works, you can contribute cash or assets. So this could be appreciated stock, it could be part of a business, uh, it could be cash from your checking or, or saving account. It, but basically you take money uh, from cash or assets and you receive an income tax deduction in the current year. So you get a tax deduction and, and, and this is pretty powerful and I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Um, in the current year, and then you give it to the donor advised fund. Uh, one of the donor advised funds that we like is the Signatory because they use biblically responsible investing there. Uh, you set up your investments. You can, you can, those investments can grow. So you can invest in, you know, different market types of accounts, different mutual funds. Um, you can, you can contribute, you know, in, in, in coming years. And then as you get ready to wanting, uh, as you're wanting to give to charities, you can start uh, giving grants from the donor advised fund to your nonprofits. And so this is a huge opportunity, uh, especially if you're a big giver, or if you know that you're going to give over the next five or 10 years, and you want to, you know, bunch your deductions in one year, maybe, maybe you're going to be under the standard deduction, but uh, you have maybe uh, um, uh, some stock options that you have just exercised, or maybe you have a big gift that just came in and you want to take a large tax deduction. This is a great way to give to the donor advice fund, get the tax deduction in the current year. And then over the next, let's just say five or 10 years, you can give it to charity. One of the, be one of the benefits, huge benefits here is that you can continue on this giving fund with your kids. And so this is a fun way that we've incorporated this uh, with our family. And we were able to you know, name the charities out that we want. Uh, and it's just a great conversation to have about giving, which is a, a conversation that not a lot of 
uh, Christians even have with their family. They just kind of give it on autopilot. So some of the benefits of the donor advised fund. Well, you receive an income tax deduction for the year that you contribute to the donor advised fund, even if you choose to grant the money at a later year. So again, you can give it, just get the tax deduction in the current year. And then later on, you can decide where you actually want the money to go. You can invest your money in stocks or mutual funds. Again, we use the company called The Signature because they, they invest with biblically responsible investing uh, mutual funds and ETFs. And so this is a great way uh, to invest uh, to the glory of God while you're using it to grow uh, money to give more, which is, is just a huge benefit. Uh, and I get pretty excited about it. You can also include your fund as a beneficiary in your will or estate plan, which is a huge benefit. Um, and then you can maximize your resources with the options to contribute those complex assets, such as business interests or publicly traded securities or real estate instead of cash. So you can take appreciated ass assets. So if you have, let's say you bought stock at uh, you know, $100 a share and it's $500 a share now, well, instead of selling that stock and then giving it to the charity, you can, and, and, and you know, potentially having to pay capital gains tax on it, you can just give it to the donor advised fund and get the current uh, get the tax deduction in the current year, which is a huge benefit because then the charity gets more because you didn't have to pay taxes on it. And then of course, you can take advantage of the current tax laws before 2026, before they sunset. So again, huge benefits to the donor advice fund, a big fans of it. Another way that, like I mentioned, another way to do that is taking stocks. So I just mentioned this, you can take appreciated stock, meaning uh, stocks that have grown in value. Let's say you've had a stock for 10 years and and it's grown in value significantly, and you're thinking about giving it, well, instead of just selling it and then giving the proceeds, you can act, and then paying the taxes on it, you can just give it to the donor advised fund, give these actual securities before you sell them to the donor advised fund. Huge benefits there. Opportunity number four is life insurance. And so a lot of people don't, uh, are thinking, are, are, I'm sure you're thinking right now, well, just buying a life insurance policy and then naming naming the beneficiaries, uh, but that's not actually the way I'm, I'm discussing it. What I'm, what I'm actually talking about is, is combining a donor advised fund with life insurance. And so with life insurance, you can actually name the donor advised fund, the, you can name the, the donor advised fund, the beneficiary of your life insurance uh, uh, policy. And so some of the key benefits here, you maintain ownership of the policy. So it's flexible. You can change the beneficiary at a later date. So if you decide um, you know, the beneficiaries and the donor advice fund, you want it to be different, you want to be different uh, um, charities, you can always change those on the on the donor advice fund. And then the proceeds from the death benefit of the policy can be placed into the donor advice fund, and then granted to charities named out as beneficiaries of the donor advice fund. So this is a powerful tool, you can combine the life insurance aspect and the donor advice fund aspect, and really get uh, get the most from it. And the opportunity number five here is giving from your IRA. And there's a lot of different ways that you can give from your IRA, but I'm going to touch on uh, the, the, the biggest one, which is instead of just taking money out of your account from your IRA and giving it to charities, you can actually do what's called a qualified charitable distribution. So if anybody is um, in those later years of life, you know, let's say 60 plus um, or if you are uh, 72 plus or maybe 70 and a half plus, and you have to take what's called a required minimum distribution. So I'll explain that here. So a required minimum distribution. So when you hit your, now, when you hit your 72nd birthday, the government says, congratulations for turning 72. Now you must take any money, um, you must take money or percentage of, of it uh, from your um, non-qualified, or sorry, from your uh, tax deferred account. So IRAs, 401ks, you have to start taking money out of those accounts when you hit 72. And that's called a required minimum distribution. And so one of the ways that you can kind of get around that, and if you still are charitably inclined, you can actually give money from the IRA to the uh, charity. And it's called a qualified charitable distribution. You can give up to $100,000 from your IRA. And it does count towards your required minimum distribution, which is a huge benefit. So instead of taking money from your IRA, and then you know, paying the taxes on it and then giving it to the charity, you can just take money from your IRA directly and give it to the charity through using a qualified char charitable distribution. So it reduces your taxable income, even if you're not itemizing deductions because the money doesn't actually even come to you. So again, a huge benefit here. Um, the other opportunity, again, combining a donor advised fund with the IRA, designate your donor, donor advised fund as the beneficiary of your IRA. So you can basically take assets that pass tax-free to your donor advice fund, and this can minimize taxes and allow other assets to pass to family members at a reduced tax rate. So that, again, that's another opportunity 
uh, to, to take advantage of the donor advised fund in conjunction with the, um, with the IRA. So with that, I am going to pause because we have a guest here that I want to, I want to introduce. Uh, David Clinton is a, a giving coach. Uh, he and I have had a conversation in the past before. He just has a heart for giving. And I want to invite him to talk about some of the reasons why people might not be inclined to give, or maybe they're not sure how to even start giving or where to start giving. So David, I want to open up the conversation to you. Feel free to share kind of the three misconceptions why people aren't giving today. Great. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. And I love the things you've been talking about. Um, these uh, We can take for granted some of these strategies when we're steeped in the industry um, and realize that there uh, are ways to leverage our, our giving, like the um, signatory, the DAF, uh, giving from your IRA, things like this. Uh, amazing ways to both give and experience that joy and save taxes at the same time. I like what you said. Um, we should pay our taxes and with with gratefulness for the things that the government does provide. Uh, but we don't need to tip the government. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I find that um, we often give because we feel we should. And it becomes this uh, ought in our lives instead of something we want to do. And what I've experienced, though, is um, in my own life and in the lives of those I've, I've served, that when we switch our mindset, we really realize that all this stuff I have is God's, right? Like you said earlier, 100% of the things we have belong to God. Yeah. And, and we're just stewards, we're managers of his stuff. Then when we give, uh, we feel so much more joy and freedom. I, I've grown to a place over the last couple of years that I'm no longer giving because I feel I should. I'm giving because it's exciting. Yeah. I'd love to help others experience the same joy and the, the true financial freedom that I've experienced from giving. One of the things that tends to get in the way um, is, is the mindset of scarcity. You know, being afraid of where am I going to get the next dollar? And we all grew up with this, um, and I'm sure it's not even just an American thing. It's it's all over the world. I think this is a, a tool um, the the adversary uses to to keep us from ge being generous, to keep us living in fear. And uh, one of the big things to to recognize in ourselves and to try to overcome is that mindset of scarcity. We serve an abundantly generous God, and uh, there there's no shortage of what He has and can give to us. Uh, and we can feel free to let these blessings flow through our fingers and to bless others. And when we do, in that exchange, what we really get is joy and, um, and excitement for who we've been able to help. Um, and, and the more you exercise that muscle, the, the easier it gets. Uh, one of the, uh, the second thing that comes to mind that often is a barrier for cheerful giving is um, lack of uh, clarity around issues that are important to us. You know, um, I might, I hate human trafficking. I despise it. I, I don't know what to do about it, right? And so I just, I ignore it and I put it out of my mind because I've got a lot of things going on in life. Um, I, I try to come alongside and help offer clarity to people. Let's dig in and figure out where your heart is. How has God made you uniquely? Um, and, and what has he put in your heart to be excited about giving toward? Some people have a, a tie to a certain country, maybe Uganda. They're excited about Uganda. They want to help people in communities in that country. Great. Let's let's lean into that and, and run after it hard. Other people are um, excited about faith and work uh, uh, ministries that are helping people do their work with excellence. And I love that. And God has given us each a different heart for giving. We can't all be excited about the exact same things. There's a lot of good things that are being done out there. I'd love to help people find theirs and, and bring clarity to the issues that are important to them. Uh, a third way that I find uh, can be a barrier to cheerful giving is just feeling overwhelmed. There are so many things out there, um, so many opportunities to give to, and, and I don't know who, what, when, um, why, and how I should be giving. And so I just put it on the back burner and think, I'll get to that later. But the truth is the busyness never stops, right? Um, and if you take the time to go th through these, the process to see who, who do I want to give to? Why do I want to give to them at all? Uh, when does it make sense from a tax standpoint, from the resources I have, um, all these sorts of issues. When you spend maybe an hour or two just go digging into them and focusing on them, you get through them at the end, the, the overwhelm 
uh, stops and the clarity is, is amazing. And then the joy you receive as a giver yeah. is magnified. So those are three of the, the barriers to cheerful giving that, um, that I'd love to help anybody out uh, who, who is struggling with those things. And let's, let's have a chat. Yeah, thank you, David, for sharing. I want to just say thanks again for coming on and sharing those things. I, I think, you know, he's talking about the barriers to, cheer, to cheerful giving, scarcity mindset, the lack of clarity, and feeling overwhelmed. I think those, um, a lot of people struggle with those. I know I have had times in, in my past where I have felt overwhelmed. I, I feel, I see a need or I see an ad or I see just God put something on my heart, but I don't know necessarily how to fulfill that. And so I think having someone come alongside you, uh, have a giving coach, have someone that can, that can really step in and take that, take that weight off your shoulders. So I know a lot of people are excited about what we've been talking about. If you feel overwhelmed, that's normal, as David was just talking about. Um, but, but how can you get clarity, get understanding uh, that uh, what I would say is book a call. You can schedule a call uh, with myself or with uh, David. Um, what, you, what you're going to get on this call, though, I want to talk about. We go over your current financial situation. We go over your, we want to discuss your values, how you view money, your specific tax situation to see if you can take advantage of these, any of these tax planning opportunities. And then finally, where you want to be financially. Maybe you are, maybe you do have a scarcity mindset, or maybe you have, you know, maybe you lack clarity in, in understanding what you should be doing with your finances or what you should be doing with your, um, with, with your tax planning opportunities. And so I want to make sure that you, um, you understand the resources uh, that are available to you uh, through that. And so um, the other thing that you'll get is uh, we'll look at the problems you're facing financially. So that might be from a tax perspective, that might be from a, a financial perspective. You might not have goals that you wanna, uh, that, that you might have to have defined. So we wanna talk about what are those goals that you need uh, to define and how to overcome any obstacles. And then we'll also see if it makes sense for you to implement a faith-driven financial and giving plan. Again, talk about the tax strategies, see if there's anything um, that's applicable to you. So yeah, you should book a call if you want to be a better steward and become a more faithful manager of the resources that God's given you. Uh, you might want to align your biblical values with your investments. Uh, you might have financial goals, but you don't feel like you have a clear financial system uh, and roadmap uh, and the tools to get you there. Uh, you might have a financial advisor, but you don't feel like they're helping you become a better steward. I know when I first started working with a financial advisor almost 15 years ago, the stewardship and giving was not part of the conversation. So I think it's important to, to evaluate uh, the people that are giving you counsel. Uh, maybe you're a DIYer and you just want to make sure you're not missing something. I have a lot of people that reach out to me because of that. Uh, you want to learn strategies to be more tax efficient, especially in your giving. Again, we're talking about different tax planning opportunities. They might be a fit. Some of them might be a fit for you. Some others might not, but there are opportunities there to evaluate. Uh, you want to develop a, a, a legacy and leave values and valuables to the next generation. Uh, maybe you want to model the biblical stewardship to your family and leave a biblical legacy. Maybe you feel like you have several faith-driven financial goals, but you don't know which one to focus on first. You don't have a clearly defined roadmap. Maybe you just feel stuck or stagnant. And, and again, I, I've seen a lot of people, and, and I'm sure David can talk about this, but you might feel stuck or stagnant in your giving. You might put your giving on autopilot and you might not be very intentional about how you're giving or where you're giving or feel just overwhelmed by, by, the, uh, by the resources that you're, you're missing out on. Or maybe you're looking for more structure and confidence with your finances, or maybe you could just feel like you need some more guidance and direction. And so if that seems like you, I would just say, just encourage you, uh, book a call. Um, I'm going to put this, uh, the link here in the, in the chat box, and you can review that. You can set up a time to meet with, with myself, and I can get you connected with David if you want to have more of a, a defined and refined approach to giving. Um, but, but, uh, but I'll say with that, I, just take the next step. Wherever you are in your financial journey, just take the next step. Understand the resources that are available to you. Um, again, the other uh, the other thing I would be taking advantage of is the resources that we provide on our website. And so if you go to wisewealthwellness.com uh, slash resources, uh, those, those resources are available and, and you can access those uh, free of charge. We just want to be a blessing to people. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for for being here today. I want to thank David uh, for talking about how to give, the barriers to giving, and I hope you learned something about taking advantage of these tax planning opportunities. And with that, I will just say thank you, God bless, and I hope you have an amazing day. 
And if there are any questions, or if you have any questions, uh, I can you can raise your hand and I can unmute you if you have specific questions about any of the topics, or you have a question for David, uh, Clinton, feel free to just unmute yourself, and um, and we can uh, unmute. Or sorry, you can um, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you, and we can talk more about uh, anything you want to talk about. Uh, all right, we have someone here. Let's see. All right, uh, another David. Go ahead, David. <laughs> hello, hello. I just want to say, man, I was just uh, sitting there cleaning, sweeping my house up, cleaning up. No one's here with me, and I just want to say thanks for uh, this this uh, presentation, man. Because I'm struggling. Me and my wife sort of struggling financially, and I believe I can go on the website and get something that can help us for sure. Well, praise God, man. That that's that's a blessing to hear, and I'm really glad that you're here because I think yeah, so many people need to implement biblical principles in their finances. And especially as a married couple, I know when my wife and I got on the same page financially, it just it supercharged our efforts because I believe God was in the mix uh, in our marriage as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or uh, comments? Anybody wanna ask a question? All right. Well, again, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, David, I appreciate your, the resources that you shared. Uh, if anyone re wants to reach out to David, uh, David, where's the best place uh, people can find you? Uh, you can email me, David, at findmefaithful.org. Um, I can also be found on LinkedIn and happy to help. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. I'll put his information uh, in the chat box as well. Uh, it's just David at findmefaithful.org. Great information, great resources there. So uh, take advantage of, of that offer as well. But all right, everyone, thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, really enjoy the conversation and uh, appreciate everyone's feedback. Have a great day, everyone. You as well. Thank you for having Thank me. Bye-bye.